am Aubrey Hicks from the Bedrosian Center. And uh, we have an alum and an assistant professor who is soon to be, soon to be an associate professor. Let's hope so. <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, your new book. Well, actually, you're going to talk about your new book, and, and then we're going to ask some questions. Um, Anthony, uh, what is the title of your new book? Keeping Races in Their Places, The Dividing Lines That Shape the American City. Um, okay, so you got your PhD uh, here at Price. 2018, I, I believe. 2018. Yeah. And so you've been teaching at Cal Poly Pomona. Yep. In the um, finance, real estate, and law department. That's right. Uh, and you teach um, real estate courses? I teach real estate, and I also teach personal money management, which is a lot of fun, mostly to non-finance students. So this is a book on redlining. What got you started uh, researching redlining? It was actually, I mean, it was at USC. So, you know, my dissertation advisor was Raphael Bostic, who used to be the uh, the head of the Bedrosian Center. So we all miss him. Um, and he, he and I had a lot of conversations about segregation and fair housing over the years. And um Two of his other PhD students at the time, Sieva Rodniansky and Brian Ann and I decided to dig into the redlining maps that were drawn in the 1930s. Um, and one of the nice things about this world, this digital age that we live in, is that the maps are now available online and they're digitized. And so you can turn them into data. You can use them to line them up with other data sets. And you can ask questions like, what are the long-term effects of these maps? They're not just an interesting thing to look at anymore. They're actually tools to create experiments. You know, these people grew up on this side of the line. Other people grew up on that side of the line. How have their life experiences been different as a result? So that's how I first got interested in it. And then we wrote a paper on that and I presented it at a conference and um, an editor from Rutledge came to me and said, do you think this is a book? And I thought, well, there's been plenty of books written about segregation before. But then I realized there hasn't been a book that really tells the whole story of redlining from the beginning, why it happened, why they drew these maps and using the most recent economic evidence. And I'm mostly relying on the economics literature here just because that's my training. I, I quote pl urban planners and urban sociologists in the book, but I don't want to go too far into pretending like I, I, I know their field as well as they do. But the long-term effects have only been measured in the last five years or so. These are brand new papers. So it's kind of my opportunity to lift up all these great voices that are in the field. I really feel like they did the heavy lifting and I'm just tying them together into a narrative. Excellent. Well, um, so I'm gonna let you go ahead and share your screen and give your talk. Um, I, I might interrupt you with questions, but probably sure. not. Um, for uh, attendees, uh, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A. Um, you can also put them in the chat and um, I will see them in the chat, but the Q&A is probably the place where everyone will be able to see your questions. So um, thank you so much. I'm really excited to learn about your book and I can't wait until I have a physical copy. Thanks for having me. They told me that my copies just shipped. I don't think anybody else has oh. had but that's my advanced exciting. copies finally shipped. So I'm hoping I get them in a few days and that's hey. going to be a really good feeling. So hopefully yours are right behind them. I don't know. We'll see. Right. The supply chain issues. Honestly, I, the, the whole publishing industry is backed up, but fingers crossed. It is. All right. Uh -huh. So yeah, I, I threw together a few slides. Obviously, I can't cover an entire book in this period of time. And why would I want to? Because <laughs> I obviously want you to buy the book and, and, and hopefully find it um, useful and interesting. Um, I don't know if the word enjoyable is right, because it's a tragic topic, obviously. But I hope that it's um, a story that you find compelling. I certainly found doing the research compelling. And I hope that you find that it is inspirational in some ways, because even though a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about are quite sad things that happened, um, there are also a lot of heroes in the book, people who often are left out of our history books, at least the textbooks that I saw. Uh, in my years in school. And I think it's time that we highlight the ways that they have struggled to overcome redlining and its legacies. And in some ways they've been successful. And, and that gives us hope, I think, 
that it is possible to overcome the legacy of redlining. And I'll talk in detail about what redlining is and where it came from, so we're all on the same page. But let me start the story with one of those heroes. So this is Richard R. Wright, not to be confused with the author Richard Wright. Um, and if you're anything like me, you never come came across his name in your high school textbooks or anything like that. But he was an extraordinary American. Richard R. Wright was born a slave on a Georgia plantation in 1855. He was eventually emancipated. He grew up in Georgia and he became highly educated. He fought for the U.S. military overseas, and he eventually became one of the first black university presidents in American history. We're talking about the 19th century, a time when that was extremely rare. It's still more rare than it should be, but it was even rarer then. And he believed very deeply that education was one of the keys to success and to narrowing the gaps that he observed and the injustices that he observed um, between Black and white Americans in the South. But later in his life, he had a change of heart. His daughter was at a bank one day, a bank that was a normal bank that she frequented, owned by white Southerners, as all the banks in the area were. And she was treated pretty rudely by the bank teller. And there was a white woman next to her who was treated wonderfully. And she commented on this and she asked why she wasn't being given the same level of service as the white woman next to her. And the officials at the bank physically threw her out of the bank. When Richard Wright heard this, he was devastated. First of all, that his daughter had been manhandled that way, but also that after all these years that he dedicated himself to trying to uplift the members of his community, that this was still possible to be treated this way, that education wasn't enough to overcome the injustices that he was seeing. And he realized that having the skills to succeed in the modern economy simply wasn't enough. You also had to have access to the opportunities and to fair treatment in ways that his daughter wasn't. And so late in life, he packed up his bags, moved north to Philadelphia, and opened his own bank. He had a second career into his 60s and 70s and 80s, running one of the few Black-owned banks in the United States. And it was successful. It was so successful that it survived the Great Depression. It survived when most banks in the area collapsed, certainly most Black-owned banks collapsed, and throughout that time period, he founded the National Negro Bankers Association, the NNBA, which every year would bring together the few Black bankers, there were several dozen at the height of Black banking in the early 20th century, would bring them together once a year throughout the country so that they could work together and figure out ways to expand access to capital to their communities. I tell that story uh, not only because it's a story worth telling, um, and not only because it's um, a hero and a role model worth following, but because his goal was the goal that we are still struggling to achieve today after decades of redlining. And that is access to capital for all Americans, affordable capital, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of skin color. This book is the story of why and how we have failed him. Richard Wright was part of what became known as the Great Migration. He didn't think that he would be a part of the Great Migration. He wasn't leaving the South because he thought he was going to start a new life per se. Remember, he was near the end of his life at the time, and yet he was part of the millions of Black Southerners who moved up north without a clue of whether it would work out, an incredibly brave act to escape the villainy and the tyranny and the violence of the South in the Jim Crow era in the late 19th to early 20th century. It was this influx of Black Americans into 
particularly northern cities, but even cities in the south from rural to urban areas that changed the demographic composition of the cities. And that change is unfortunately what initiated a backlash among the white Americans who were already living there in ways that shaped our cities to this day. One thing that you notice is that Black Southerners didn't really leave the South in large numbers until the late 19th century, and a lot of people have asked why. One of the questions that I ask in the book is what they were hoping to find when they came to the North, because I think it's important to understand their expectations if we find that redlining was going to dash their expectations. And the answer is, first and foremost, that they were trying to escape violence. There's a lot of good studies that I cite in the book that show that when lynchings were increasing in a particular area, that area was much more likely to have people leaving, Black Americans leaving, boarding the trains, escaping to the North. And I do use the word escaping because even though slavery had officially ended, the kind of debt contracts that they were locked in was in a lot of ways, another form of slavery, and they could have faced very severe repercussions if a lot of them had been caught in escaping. But the other thing that we find is that it was tough competition when they came up to the North. They knew that when they got to the Northern cities, they were going to be at the bottom of the labor hierarchy. They were going to be competing for the lowest wage jobs. And that meant that they would have to compete against foreign immigrants who were currently occupying those jobs. And so one of the really interesting data points that I found in my research here is you can see this opposite correlation that just jumps out at you, that black migrants knew that the times to move up north were when the jobs were available because foreign immigration had dropped. And when foreign immigration dropped the most and the most persistently was in the 19 teens and the 1920s, for two reasons. One is that World War I made it very difficult for them to immigrate. The waters were very dangerous um, with war boats floating around. And second of all is that the United States adopted foreign immigration quotas and just literally put a stop to foreign immigration. This resulted in a big upsurge in Black migration. And the fact that these things are kind of what a social scientist would call exogenous to black migration, meaning they were not caused by black migration, they were thrown upon the United States, the foreign quotas in World War I, means that when black migration surges during this time, we could almost think of it like a natural experiment. And that's where a lot of the great social science that's been done and cited in this book begins. It begins with this national experiment of throughout the country, throughout these cities, what happens when you have a bunch of newcomers and particularly newcomers who are viewed differently. And I want to emphasize view because we all know from a lot of research throughout the sciences that race is a social construct. So this is this is a perception that's changing of who is coming to the cities and how they're going to be treated. At the time, there wasn't a lot of space that they were allowed to occupy, but there's also not a lot of space that they could affordably occupy. For those of you who know Cook County, Chicago, Illinois, you know that the lake is along the eastern side here. And you might know that a lot of the major train lines at the time ran up along the coast. So if you imagine that you are a migrant coming up from the south, you're coming up that train line on the right hand side, you're going to see the lake. And on the left hand side, what do you see? Well, the way we know that cities developed is that the train lines were developed in conjunction with a lot of industrial areas. If you were going to build a manufacturing plant, if you were going to build some sort of factory, some sort of distribution center, you wanted it to be light, right on the train lines so that you could take your products and you could drop them right on the train and you could carry them off to market. You don't have to travel to get to a train drop-off point. So that means that as you're coming up, you're seeing the lake on the right and you're seeing all these fumes and all this smoke billowing on the left-hand side. Now, if you are a black resident of this train traveling there, 
you probably aren't surprised to see all that smoke because you were placed, placed, forced to be in the very first train car right behind the engine. And the reason for that is because in the South, when you boarded the train, you were considered to be a second class citizen. And so you are going to be at the very front so that you would be the first to breathe in the smoke and the fumes. And if the train derailed, you would be get hit, you would get hit first. So you've been breathing in the smoke and the soot for a couple of days now. And now you come up into Chicago and you see the smoke and the soot on the left-hand side. So you get out of the train right around here. And where do you go? You turn on your heels and you come back south right along the train line because the only place that you can afford to live is right next to those factories, the place where nobody else wants to live because who wants to be breathing in smoke and soot 24 seven for their entire lives. So in a lot of ways, segregation was economic even before it was really instilled in our laws. The federal government is playing no role at this point. Even the city governments probably don't have very strong regulations just yet. Now, if you stepped foot outside of your neighborhood into a white neighborhood and you tried to go look to buy houses there, you would certainly find that you weren't welcome. You might find that you were violently opposed, but there weren't as many laws put in place to keep you from going to those neighborhoods yet at this point. It's economic. And part of the reason why the segregation is economic is because there hasn't been a big influence, influx of black migrants just yet. So there's nothing motivating the white Chicago residents to really adopt laws because they don't see this as a problem just yet. But as the population swells, as the great migration grows, there's only so much room for the new residents. They start pushing on the boundaries of, this is what we now call the South Side in Chicago. And the South Side extends a lot further than this nowadays, but back then it was a pretty small area. And you can see that this is where most of the black population was concentrated. Same thing happens in Pittsburgh. This is where the train lines would meet right here in the downtown area. And this was the black neighborhood, the predominantly black neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And the same thing in Boston. Here's the, the famous South End in Boston. I use these three cities throughout the book kind of as case studies. Now, all the studies that I'm citing, they look at you know cities all across the country. So it's not just these three cities that this happens in, but these are three useful cities to think about what's happening. This influx is unique to the black population. So you can see here how it's increasing and increasing people moving out of the South and into the West and the Midwest and the Northeast. And you don't see these same sort of patterns when you look at white migration. This was not just a fact of people moving. It was a certain group of people moving, trying to get away from violence. And that's how we know that it was changing the demographic composition of the cities. So if you look at the white immigration statistics, you see very little movement. The only movement that really stands out is that they're moving west. And that's because a lot of people are moving west. The west hasn't been very well settled yet at this point. This comes at a really interesting time in American history. It comes at a time when cities are expanding, when the access to capital is expanding, but as you won't be surprised to learn, access to capital isn't expanding for everybody. The country is urbanizing. We've had the second industrial, what economic historians call the second industrial revolution near the end of the 19th century. You've got titans of industry like John Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie with giant corporations. This is new. This is not the way that the world economy has typically worked. And in this new economy, cities are where the productive jobs are. And so people are moving into the cities, even in the South, which has historically been a very agricultural uh, society. You can see that it goes from 20% of the population living in urban areas up to almost 40%. And by the time we get to 1940, over half of the American population is living in cities. 
Now, this is around the time when Henry Ford is introducing the Model T. Cars are starting to become affordable for most Americans, and that changes the landscape of cities. It opens up vast swaths of land, especially out in the suburbs, that people couldn't previously live in and commute into the downtown area. So cities are expanding. People are able to move far away where the land is cheap and get great big houses. And they're able to go anywhere they want as long as there are roads. It used to be that where you go was confined to where you could walk or where you could take a train. But no, cars can move laterally. They don't just have to follow the radius of a train. They can go anywhere as long as there's a path that they can drive over. And so this massive development boom happens. And here's where capital comes into it. Wall Street sees this as an unprecedented opportunity. And Wall Street is right. It is. You can see here massive growth in mortgage lending in a way that had never happened before in American history. This data goes all the way back to 1897. And you can see it's not until the roaring 20s when mortgages boom, whether you measure them in terms of the net flow in billions of dollars or you measure them in the growth rate uh, which is the percentages here in the orange columns. This is important for a couple of reasons. One is because it's going to set the stage for redlining. And two is because a little sub story that I discovered in doing this research is just how much of the roaring 20s and the Great Depression had to do with real estate. Some researchers after the Great Recession that we all lived through about a decade ago, some researchers finally went back to the era of the Great Depression and started surmising, you know, maybe it's not all about the stock market crash in 1929. Maybe it's not all about uh, the Federal Reserve policy or tariffs. Maybe the fact that housing prices went crazy has something to do with this. And yes, I, I, I might be a little biased because I'm a real estate scholar, but you know, the more I dug into it, the more astonishing the numbers are. And they do indicate that business cycles matter not just because it, not just because fluctuations in the economy matter, but because the way those fluctuations happen affect inequality, affect the distribution of money between high and low incomes, between different races and ethnicities, and so on. And that's a story that we see happening here. This boom in lending is a huge boost in profits to a bunch of different types of organizations. And in the book, I actually have a chapter where I go into pretty good detail if you really want to know the finance of how mortgages worked back then. I hope I made it really easy for anybody to understand. But I'm going to give you the short answer of why this matters for redlining. It matters because of the types of mortgages that were issued and the fact that they blew up during the Great Depression. Nowadays, most Americans, when they get a mortgage, they get a long-term fixed rate mortgage. You get a mortgage and you have a constant mortgage payment. You pay the exact same mortgage payment every month for the next 30 years or however long you want to keep paying it until you decide to pay it all off. That mortgage didn't exist back then. For a lot of reasons that aren't worth getting into right now, that was a risky mortgage. Basically, lenders didn't want to commit themselves to that long of a contract. And so they had shorter term mortgages. They had adjustable rate mortgages. They had mortgages that ended sooner. And so in order to pay off your house, you probably needed multiple of those mortgages. You'd get a mortgage for three or four or five years, and you couldn't pay off a house in that amount of time. So when the mortgage was up, you'd get a new mortgage to pay off the old mortgage, and you'd pay that off for another three or four or five years. And you'd just keep doing that until the house was paid off. And that system works as long as you can always get a new mortgage when you need it. Because you're not guaranteed to have the capital for 30 years to give you time to pay it off. So as long as the market is booming and you can either sell your house or get a new mortgage to pay off the old mortgage, everything is gravy. But as we all know, that's not how the 1920s ended. This created an interesting incentive 
And it's something that should be familiar to those of us who lived through the last housing bubble. One of my mentors who got me into this field is Susan Wachter over at Wharton. And some of you who are attending may know Susan because she's friends with a lot of people at the Price School. And she and her colleague, Andre Pavlov, after the last recession, or actually during the bubble, really, started pointing out that one way you can identify a credit bubble is by measuring mortgage risk premium. You take the mortgage rate and you subtract away treasury bonds. So the only piece of the mortgage rate that's left is the additional risk that the mortgage market is pricing in. And if that's a little technical, it, it's okay. You don't have to follow all of that. The point is this. When there is an increasing demand for mortgages because people want to buy homes, well, what does demand do? It pushes up prices. It doesn't just push up prices for homes. It also pushes up the price of credit, which means these mortgage rates are going to rise. That's because more people want mortgages. They're willing to pay more. That makes sense. Where you start to see flashing danger signs is when those, this mortgage rate, this risk premium comes down at the same time that the bubble is still continuing. Because what that suggests is that lenders are so desperate to make money on this bubble that they will lower their interest rates even though prices are going crazy. In other words, even though the riskiness of the market is increasing and they're issuing loans to increasingly risky people, they're actually charging less. And that's dangerous because the interest rate that they charge is supposed to compensate them for any future losses. When that rate is going down, they are less protected if anything bad should happen. So I, I think I'm the first person to do this. I calculated the risk premium at this time period, the way that we've been able to do uh, in more recent times. I went back and found in the archives the old mortgage rate data. And it's really interesting because you see at the beginning of the 20s, an increase in mortgage rates, which is exactly what you'd expect if more and more people are trying to buy homes and they're settling the suburbs like we talked about. But then when the prices really get out of control is the late 20s and the spread decreases in all of these cities where we have data, which means that lenders are just dropping their mortgage rates because they just want to make money on the bubble. They don't even care about the fact that the loans they're issuing are getting riskier and riskier and riskier. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's the exact same thing we just lived through uh, in the early 2000s. As a result, they even come up with new ways to issue money into the real estate market. They call them real estate bonds. They take mortgages, put them into securities, and then sell pieces of those securities out to Wall Street. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's the exact same thing that Wall Street did in the early 2000s, except they called it mortgage-backed securitization. And we all thought it was brand new. It wasn't. It was invented in the 1920s. But the really crazy part about these new ways to invest in real estate is that at the same time that the value of them is increasing, meaning at the same time that they're investing more and more and more money into these real estate bonds, the delinquency rates of the bonds are increasing, which means they're losing more and more money at the same time that they're investing more and more into it. It's a classic credit bubble. Last part of the story before we get to redlining. This boom led to a huge boom in prices, but not in black neighborhoods. It led to a boom in the high-end neighborhoods, the wealthier neighborhoods, the whiter neighborhoods, but not on the south side of Chicago, not in the south end of Boston. The, what, we, what economists call the low-end neighborhoods, the lower-priced neighborhoods, they had a very mild appreciation up to the mid-1920s. By the end of the 20s, that boom was gone. This bubble in housing prices was entirely in the white areas. Now, let's talk for a minute about why that is because it gives us an idea of where redlining came from. If all residents of the city had access to the same opportunities, we probably wouldn't see this kind of bifurcation because 
People in the low-end neighborhoods would be able to get mortgage credit just like people in the high-end neighborhoods. People in the low-end neighborhoods could make more money and move into the high-end neighborhoods and compete, and it would all be just one market. Why is there this segmentation? And the answer is because at this time period, now there are policies in place to keep races in their places. The first one is racial zoning. Cities develop zoning ordinances that specifically say, in this neighborhood, you can only have white residents. In that neighborhood, you can have residents of color. But that doesn't last very long, the racial zoning. In 1917, the Supreme Court rules in Buchanan v. Warley that that is unconstitutional. I talk a little bit about that case in the book. I think the interesting and ironic thing and very revealing thing about that case is that the Supreme Court essentially rules that it's unconstitutional because it's hurting the pocketbooks of a white person. The white person wants to sell their house to the black resident. And because the white person can't do that, they can't get the money that they want. Racial zoning isn't bad for the people who are oppressed. It's bad for the person who's trying to make some money uh, who is white. So that's an interesting uh, little tidbit about that. But so that happens in 1917. And so then we start to adopt the kind of zoning rules that we have in place now. And you can kind of think of our zoning rules. I've probably got urban planners on, on the webinar today, and they know way more about zoning than I do. But, you know, you can think of zoning as broken up into a couple different categories. There's density zoning, which restricts how much real estate you can put on a particular piece of land, whether it has to be set back from the street, whether it can be a certain, uh, certain height, et cetera. And then you've got use zoning, which is where you say housing has to be over here and factories have to be over there. That way, if a kid is in their backyard, they're not breathing in the smoke from the industrial areas. Well, some great economists, Allison Scherzer, Tate Twynham, and Randy Walsh, went back and looked at these old zoning ordinances that sounded like they were colorblind right? They're not racial. There's nothing that says anything about races. And they find, of course, they're racial. The neighborhoods that currently had white residents in there were just supposed to be single family housing forevermore. The zoning said you have to have single family houses. They have to be big lots. Basically, only wealthy white people can live there unless you can figure out a way to scrape together the money. And the neighborhoods where the black residents are concentrated, that's the areas where you can build factories. And that's the areas where you can build really tall tenement buildings and who cares what quality they are. Nothing surprising to anybody who's studied the history of zoning. We all know that it was racially motivated, but the ability to digitize those maps and to go back in time really made it clear just how much they were. The other thing that started happening was if the zoning isn't strong enough to protect your neighborhood, you can put a restrictive covenant in the deed of the house. Now, a private individual can do this. A developer can do this when they're, when they're building a certain development. They can say in these houses, they cannot be sold to anyone other than a Caucasian person. And because it's not the city imposing it, for a few decades, that is considered constitutional. It eventually gets outlawed in the 40s. But through the 19 teens and 20s and 30s, these restrictive covenants prevent Black Americans and foreign immigrants and Jewish Americans from leaving the neighborhoods where they don't have access to opportunity and moving to areas where they might actually have better access to opportunity. I want to point out something interesting that was a theme throughout the book. There's a team of economists who studied the restrictive covenants in Minneapolis. They were able to get their hands on a huge data set of them and actually go through them one by one and look at where they are, map them out. Again, the digitizing of maps has been a tremendous boon to our ability to understand this stuff. So these economists, Sarad Yasud, William Spiegel, and Kevin Ehrman Solberg, they found that it was not the wealthy neighborhoods that adopted restrictive covenants. It was the low-priced white neighborhoods that adopted restrictive covenants. And the reason is because those are the neighborhoods that Black residents are most likely to move into. 
as you climb the socioeconomic ladder, you don't immediately go buy an expensive house. You go buy a house that's next up the ladder. And so the people who felt the most threatened were the white working class. And the reason this is a running theme throughout the book is because there's great evidence showing that the exact same thing was happening back in the South during the Jim Crow era. Lynchings often spiked up dramatically when the local white working class felt economically threatened. When unemployment went up and there weren't enough jobs to go around, the white working class who were low skilled were the ones who were doing the lynchings to keep races in their places, to prevent black workers from competing with them for the same jobs. Edna Bonasich, the famous sociologist, called this the split labor market. When you've got two groups of Americans, or two groups of any, sorry, of anybody, two groups of workers who are competing for the same jobs and suddenly jobs become scarce, if one of those groups has more power than the other, they will figure out a violent way to impose that, that power on the others so that they can have the jobs. What I argue throughout the book is that that split labor market did not end in the South. It followed them up the train lines into the northern cities, and it translated into a split housing market. Now, it's into this split housing market that redlining is born. The trigger for redlining is the Great Depression. Now, I realize I've got about 20 minutes left, and I told you I, I wouldn't come near nearly close enough to, uh, to going through the whole book. So we'll get into a little bit of what motivated redlining and how it all happened, but we won't talk about its long-term effects. You'll probably have to read the book for that. I'll try to finish a few minutes early to answer some questions. I think there are a couple in the chat there. So why is the Great Depression central to this story? Well, it's because the Great Depression was such a housing crisis, and that motivates the federal government to change the way that the housing market operates. You can see here the crash in construction spending, the crash in the number of new houses that are being built. And that crash lasts for a decade. It peaks in 1924, 25, excuse me, and it keeps falling all the way until the mid 30s, at which point it's going to take a long time. If I continued this data out to the 50s, you would see it takes a long time for the market to bounce back to anything like what it used to be. And of course, that housing price crash is almost entirely concentrated in the white neighborhoods because the low end neighborhoods didn't have as much of a boom to begin with, but they do experience a decline as well. I kind of find it fascinating that by the end of the 30s, by the end of the Great Depression, after two decades of booms and busts, the high end and low end neighborhoods are back to the exact same spot. So that entire roaring 20s didn't do anything for home values, although it did create a lot of beautiful homes for those white residents to live in. This triggers a financial crisis. All those lenders that we talked about, suddenly they're not willing to issue any new loans to borrowers. Remember that the loans that they were issuing were short term, which means you get to three or four or five years and your loan ends and you have to pay off the rest of it, and you don't have the money unless you can get a new loan. Well, it's the Great Depression. You're not going to get a new loan. The lenders don't want to give you a new loan. You could be unemployed. You could lose your job tomorrow. They don't trust you. You're not a reliable borrower anymore. So lending comes to a halt. You can see here, again, measuring either billions of dollars of net mortgages or the growth rate of mortgages. There's actually negative growth meaning that even the number of mortgages that are out there is decreasing. Not only are we not adding more mortgages, we are actually foreclosing on properties, ending the mortgages that currently exist. And the, the financial sector goes into a contraction until the end of the 1930s. And that's where you can see a lot of the cause of the Great Depression. But this also causes massive financial distress for the banks themselves. They're losing money on all these people who are defaulting on their mortgages. 
They're losing money just because they can't issue new mortgages. And so you see negative profits, negative asset growth, and the banks are motivated to try to change the system and to acquiesce to whatever it is that President Roosevelt, when he comes into office, wants to do to try to reinstill confidence in the banking system. His solution is the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And that is the beginning of redlining. He puts together the Homeowners Loan Act. The idea is basically this. We're going to create a corporation. It'll be created by the government, but it'll be an independent group. Uh, we'll fund it for a certain number of years and that with a loan, and then someday they'll pay us, the government, back. This corporation will go around to mortgage lenders, and they'll say, you've got a lot of loans in foreclosure on your balance sheet. A lot of people who you're trying to take their homes away, they're not paying their mortgages and you're losing money on those things. We have an incentive to try to keep those people in their homes. So here's what we're going to do for you, the lender. We are going to buy those mortgages from you. And in exchange, we'll give you a bond, a bond with a guaranteed payment. So you will keep getting paid. Whereas if you hold on to the mortgage loan, you're stuck with a borrower who's not making payments. We will give you a bond that keeps income coming into your pocket. It's, back, it's guaranteed by us. It's backed up by the U.S. government. It's a great deal for you. You get that non-performing loan off your balance sheet. You give it to us. Mortgage lender says, great, great idea. Now, what do you do? You're, now you're the homeowner's loan corporation. You just bought all of these mortgages that are in foreclosure. Not a very good investment. What are you going to do? You're going to go to the borrowers, to the homeowners, and you're going to say, listen, I know times are tough. You're having trouble paying off your mortgage. The lender was going to take the house away from you. We've got a better idea. We're going to extend the length of the mortgage. Remember how I said that back then lenders didn't want long-term fixed rate mortgages? We're going to do that for you. We're going to extend it 20, 25 years. If you have a longer time period to pay it off, that means that each mortgage payment itself can be smaller because we can stretch it out over a longer period of time. And each mortgage payment can be a lot more affordable. Now, some of you are still going to default and some of you are still going to lose your homes because some of you are just never going to get back on your feet because that's how a depression works. But we're going to try to help as many of you as we can get back on our feet. And that's what they do. It's a tremendous success. They refinance about a million mortgages and they do it in less than two years. Not everybody who applies qualifies, but over time through 1933, 34, and into 35, they are renegotiating, refinancing tens of thousands of mortgages every month until they've renegotiated over a million. It's a, the most ambitious act of housing finance probably in the history of the world. And this is at a time when most banks are locally focused. They make it national. They say, we're going to do this in every city across the United States, every state. An incredibly difficult job to do. Now, there is a slight misunderstanding that says that because the Homeowners Loan Corporation was the impetus for redlining, that they must have been redlining themselves, that they must have been giving loans mostly to white homeowners. There were black homeowners back then. It was about four and a half percent of uh, of the population of households were uh, were black homeowners. No, that's actually not true at all. Uh, they actually the amount of loans that they renegotiated was about proportionate to the amount of black homeowners there were, believe it or not. And I've got one better for you. The black homeowners, the, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board later studied this to find out how they did. And they found that the black homeowners were more likely to repay the loans than the white homeowners. They were actually a better investment, a better credit risk, it turned out. Pretty astonishing when you consider that the lesson they're going to learn from this experience is that they shouldn't be giving loans to those black homeowners. Uh, the data suggests the exact opposite. There's a problem, though, with the way the Homeowners Loan Corporation operated. They only are allowed by Congress to refinance mortgages that are in foreclosure. 
meaning the, the bank has actually initiated foreclosure proceedings. Well, now wait a second. There are a lot of homeowners who are in distress. They're struggling to make their mortgage payments. Maybe they missed one or two mortgage payments, but they're not in foreclosure yet. How do we help all of them? Actually, there's more of them than there are of the ones who are in foreclosure. Okay, this is where the Federal Home Loan Bank Board decides they're going to call an audible. Even though Congress doesn't really authorize them to do it, they have an idea. In those two years, that the Homeowners Loan Corporation was refinancing mortgages all across the country in a national effort that nobody had ever done before. They basically revolutionized the field of real estate appraisal. They had to create a system so they could figure out whether a million homes were worth renegotiating and how much those homes were worth, and they had to do it all across the country. Appraisal used to be a very localized business and not a very scientific business, not really any data involved, just kind of what an appraiser thought it was, it was. You go back and read old accounts from that time period, it's, it's kind of interesting how much they were just making it up. Now they feel like they've made it scientific and they want to spread that wisdom to the rest of the country. So the way they do it is they take all these appraisers around the country that they have these relationships with now and they say, in your city, Tell us what you think of every neighborhood. We're going to draw maps in every city, and we're going to divide those maps into the good neighborhoods and the bad neighborhoods. Now, these are cities that already have racist zoning policies. They already have restrictive covenants in place, and they have economic segregation that we talked about. These are not cities where everybody has access to opportunities. So if you look at them, the first thing you're going to see is significant differences between the neighborhoods. Now, the weird thing about that is if you draw a map where you say these neighborhoods are doing well and those neighborhoods are not doing well, so you should lend your money to these neighborhoods because they're a better credit risk. What you're saying is that the way the cities have looked for the last 20 years is the way you think they should look forevermore. You are issuing a map that freezes things in place. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to click on the link here, but you can look up the, the city survey program and you can look up their maps. They've all been digitized. And as I said, that was the inspiration for the book. The maps are on the Mapping Inequality Project. That's the name of the website. Richard Nelson and a small army of researchers did the hard work of digitizing them. And re we really owe them for that. I will give you a little bit of a warning before you go into these maps in any detail. You're going to be able to click on every neighborhood, and you're going to be able to see what the appraisers said about those neighborhoods, and it's ugly. I mean, it's overtly racist. Now, there's been a lot of research done in recent years asking the question, how much was redlining motivated by race? Because it, it, we know it wasn't only motivated by race. Some neighborhoods got a bad rating just because they had old buildings, a declining housing stock, or they had low incomes or they had whatever it was that the appraisers thought made it a low value, low credit, uh, not credit worthy area. But here's the thing, 95% of black families lived in the lowest graded neighborhoods. So even regardless of whether you think race was the number one reason why the, the maps were drawn the way they were, I mean, You'll see in the book, I, I quote a lot of the maps. <laughs> it was a big reason. The appraisers were not shy about saying, we don't want you to lend to this neighborhood because there are Black people living here. Or there's the possibility of, quote unquote, Negro infiltration. I mean, it's just amazing how conspiratorial they all sound. But even putting all of that aside, that we know that race was a significant motivating factor, just think about this. You are a black resident of this city. 95% of black families live in low rated areas. Regardless of what the reason is, you have very little odds of not being redlined. Only white residents really have a good chance of being in a neighborhood that will get access to mortgage capital going forward. And it's astonishing because it's not based on evidence. 
I already told you that the black homeowners were more likely to pay back their loans to the homeowners loan corporation. And remember, I showed you the graphs of how housing prices differed between the high end neighborhoods and the low end neighborhoods during the 1920s. The white neighborhoods were the only neighborhoods that got caught up in that crazy bubble. If anything, the black neighborhoods were more sober and cautious. They were the ones that didn't experience a tremendous crash in prices. Wouldn't you want to lend there? Well, no, not if you had the perspective that the appraisers and the lenders and the federal government who was overseeing this effort had at the time, which is that cities are more harmonious and real estate values are better for everyone in the long run if we just keep races in their places. And there are quotes throughout the book of policymakers who explicitly said that. The last thing I'll say before I take a couple questions here is that the rest of the book talks about the long-term effects and how we have struggled to fight back from these policies that rigidified our cities. Redlining didn't invent segregation. I don't want you to get the idea that I wrote the book on something that created the entire problem. In a lot of ways, what it did was it solidified it. It said that if this area, this particular neighborhood has low incomes and low education in 1938, we never expect it to catch up ever again. Are you kidding me? I mean, no matter how hard the people work in that area, no matter how extraordinary they are, you never want lenders to venture into that area again. This shows you just Cook County, so you can kind of see it. On the right-hand side is a digitized version of the Hulk map. And I want you to know that it became the standard practice of the entire mortgage industry until it was outlawed in 1968. This is the Federal Housing Administration, which was created to insure mortgages, to offer government insurance, which was essential. It was, most mortgages that were issued at that time had FHA insurance. It really caused the entire industry to boom, 98% of FHA mortgages went to white borrowers. And it's not just because they looked at the race of the person who was applying. It's also because they created a map that mimicked the Hulk map very, very closely. So there were two forces that were driving this to lead mortgage finance through the mid 20th century. One is that the FHA is following these maps. And two is that the Federal Home Loan Bank Board is the overseeing regulator for all the savings and loan institutions in America. And those are the institutions that issue most of the mortgages in the 20th century. And they explicitly tell their members to follow these maps. And I've got those quotes in the book as well. There has been a debate in recent years over whether these maps mattered or whether they're just showing us something that all was going to happen anyway. People are racist. Uh, they're going to act this way. The maps didn't do anything. They didn't change anything, at least. I show a lot of evidence that they really did matter and they really did change things. But it's also important for you to know that it was the explicit policy of the federal government to follow these maps and it comes at a time when Black families actually are achieving extraordinary success. If you look at home values, if you look at wages, the Black-white gaps are closing. That's the upward line that I have here shows convergence. It shows Black families catching up to white families on a lot of economic measures, but not on home ownership. So they're getting more education, they're getting more income, they're doing all the things that the map said they couldn't do. And yet they're not being allowed access to home ownership, to wealth creation, to the American dream. In the rest of the book, I talk about why that wealth gap persists even though redlining was outlawed in 1968. That was one of the driving forces for me was understanding this path dependence. Why can we not get out of the rut once we're into it, even though we overturned the policy? In that process, you will meet some real heroes who helped us to overcome a lot of the segregation and disinvestment. People like Gail Sincata and Doris Bland and Dorothy Gautreaux. And if you haven't heard those names, 
you really owe it to yourself to at least read those parts of the book or, or look them up online, because those are the people I turn to for inspiration moving forward. Them and Richard Wright, who at one point was overseeing the NNBA when there were over 90 black banks in America. And by the mid 20th century, it had fallen to eight. Because you see, it wasn't just black families who were redlined, it was black banks too. They couldn't get access to the deposit insurance that all the white banks were getting access to after the Great Depression, the savior upon which our entire banking system is built. The system has so many injustices, they're hard to count and they're so intertwined. But I hope you find, if you do pick up a copy of the book, that it helps you understand a little bit better how we found ourselves with all of these problems. And also some lessons about what are the issues that we need to disentangle in order to overcome them. Now, I realize I've darn near run out of time, but I see there are a couple of things in the Q&A. So what do you think, Aubrey? Should we try to yeah, I think so. Um, so I think the first question that came in um, was, are there zoning maps in the book? Ah, uh, I don't have the zoning maps in the book. No. Um, I There's a couple reasons for that. One of them is, I think zoning is a good motivation and it's part of it, but I did want to focus more on redlining. Um, the other is... The book is in black and white, and it's a, it, when you when you make some of these maps, it's really hard to do the heat map so it really looks good. Um, right. So unfortunately, no. But I do encourage you to go to that mapping inequality project and look up the redlining maps because they're really really well done online. Um, and that's uh, an important thing. So much of this has been digitized and so is readily available to anyone who is interested. Yeah. Um, Dowell has a question about um, the relationship to color of law. Yeah. So I talked to Richard Rothstein when I was writing the book. Um, and it was funny. I asked him, uh, is it possible for me to write a book that appeals to all the scholars in my field, but also that the public will read? And he said, no. So I stopped <laughs> trying to impress all the other professors. And I realized when I was sitting down to write the book, I was always writing it with my students in mind. Yeah. I was writing a book that they would appreciate and that they would understand. And, um, and that really helped. So I'm glad he gave me that uh, that piece of advice. I think that the connection with Rothstein is that really he only does one chapter on redlining and I pull it out and make it the focus. And um, he doesn't really have all the econometric evidence that shows the long term effects. Um, and he's making a much more legal argument. You know, right. his 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 argument is much more about how all of this is unconstitutional. And I agree with him. But um, going forward. I'm focused more on what are the economic policies that can overcome it. Um, so that leads into Liz's question um, about, is it too late? Yeah. So I'll give a very, very quick, because I don't want to uh, keep everybody, but I'll give a very, very quick um, summary of kind of the last chapter where I talk about some of the solutions. There are really two ways to approach this, and I think both of them are necessary. As we get into the second half of the book, I talk a lot about the ghettoization of Black America. And I'm using the word ghetto not as a pejorative, but rather the way that great, the great Black sociologists of history have used it, which is a, a caste system that is imposed on people who uh, have power stripped away from them. And by creating these ghettos, what redlining has done is has created a situation where there's access to opportunity in some areas and not in others. So I see essentially two ways out, and I'm following a lot of Kianga Yamada Taylor in, in this uh, as well. And that is two steps are necessary. One is you have to empower people to be able to move out of ghettos to wherever they want to live. And that means that we have to build a lot more affordable housing in high income areas. And that's not the way our affordable housing policy is set up right now. It's set up to build it in the areas where it's easiest to build it. But wealthy residents don't want it there, and so they oppose it. But I think that for too long, affordable housing policy has been separated from fair housing policy. You have to have an affordable housing policy that is actively trying to desegregate. And there are some people who are trying to do that. Stephen Menendian at the Othering and Belonging Institute up at UC Berkeley is doing great work with that. Um, people in the US Civil Rights Commission have been speaking this for years, people like Roberta Ochtenberg. But it's a hard message to make. So I think 
We need to build more of that housing in high income areas, high opportunity areas, and provide much more plentiful housing choice vouchers to allow them to afford to live in those areas. But then two is we need to invest in the areas that have become ghettos so that they no longer are stuck in the trap that redlining stuck them in. And this is a little difficult because investing in those areas can trigger some gentrification. But at the end of the book, I do show some evidence that for the residents who are able to stay in these areas, when investment happens, on average, they have really good outcomes. Yeah. Gentrification can be a force for positive if we have policies in place that allow the people to stay there and actually participate in that growth. And I, I won't get into any more detail on that, but I think you have to both allow people to move, empower people to move and invest in those areas so that they can rise up too. Because right now we have a situation where a lot of racial segregation has declined, black white segregation in recent decades, because the black middle class has been able to move out of the ghetto, but it's only left an even more disinvested ghetto behind. Right. You, you have to you have to treat both problems at the same time. Uh, so I have an additional question about um, how you think the uh, indigenous land back movement might play into possible solutions. Ah, so this is something that, that we've you, you and I have been talking about. So um, I mean, it's it's absolutely not something that I raise in the book, and I will also say that. It's absolutely not something I raise in the book, and that's because I kept the book very focused. The other kind of segregation that I don't talk about is what's happening with Hispanic and Latinx population. And a lot of the areas that are formerly redlined have very high proportions now of Latinx residents and not as much Black residents. So there is, going forward, this is really only one piece of the puzzle. I felt at some points like I was nervous about focusing it only on one type of segregation, but I also felt like if I focused on more than that, it would be too much for me to get my arms around in terms of weaving it into one narrative. So I would just say that I'm excited that my future research is planning to focus on the question you just asked. And that's all I can say for the moment. Excellent. Well, I am very excited um, for the book. Um, I'm waiting for my copy to come. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, you can go ahead and, and put them in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, this is- Or shoot me an email, you know? Or, and yes. Aubrey has my email, you know? Um, and your email is also available on your website, anthonyworlando.com. Yep. Com. Yes. I'm really excited uh, about the book. I'm, I'm particularly excited um, to see um, in black and white, as it were, the, um, the the sort of evidence that goes against the policy that we yeah. put in place. You know that that these neighborhoods that we decided not to invest in were actually neighborhoods where income was going up and where people were paying off their loans. And um, I think that's a really um, important addition to the conversation. Yeah, there have been some really great um, economic historians who I leaned on. And um, I, in doing the research, I was kind of astonished at some, I knew a lot of them and the work they'd done, but I was just astonished at the depth once I really got into it of people who've spent their entire careers measuring this stuff and have gotten very little play in the press or in most books that are written on this period of history. Um, and two in particular who come to mind are William Collins and Robert Margot, who are both, you know, they've been around for decades studying this stuff, going back to the Civil War. And one of the things that I found interesting is not just that incomes and wages were catching up, but, you know, when I talk to people about these neighborhoods now, a lot of the prejudice that exists is a belief that there's something wrong with the neighborhood, something wrong with the people who live there that, you know, victim blaming that goes on. And there are these tropes about the culture of people who live there that they are they don't want to work hard, they don't want to do what's necessary. And of course, when in social science, we all know that's wrong. But one of the things that was interesting was they studied a lot of, they followed a lot of these things like unemployment, single motherhood, things that are criticized nowadays. And they tra traced them back to the days of redlining. And they found that 
those things were not any higher in those neighborhoods when redlining was put in place. A lot of the statistics that we complain about in those neighborhoods only became problematic decades into the redlining process because redlining created a neighborhood where people couldn't thrive and didn't have opportunities. It's not a cultural thing that's been around forever. It's something that happened as a result of redlining. And uh, Donna Jean wanted to uh, indicate that, yes, these tropes are still around. Yeah. Um, and so that is the importance of, um, of books like yours uh, and continuing to talk about the actual history um, and think about how policies have helped shape uh, the problems that we have and how we can move forward. Um, yeah. This has been Hopefully, a great conversation. It's a message that gets to the right people. I mean, I, it's it's heartening to know that, you know, we have people like Raphael in positions um, where they can do something about it. Obviously, he read the book and wrote a forward to it. So he's, you know, he's at the forefront of these issues. But we need more people like him. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you so much for doing your first book talk with us. It's thank you. It's fabulous, um, and we're really looking forward to reading it. So thank you for everyone for coming. <laughs> Take care, everybody.